good evening, thank you, and thank you for being so patient while we've had a few problems. The word manuscript just means written by hand, and before the invention of printing in the West, which is in around 1450, everything had to be written by hand. So many manuscripts have survived written by ordinary people for everyday use. However, what I'm looking at in this presentation is the top of the range stuff, made for wealthy individuals or for organizations who for religious or personal reasons or both wanted an object of beauty. Many cultures East and West have produced illuminated manuscripts, but this presentation is limited to European Christian manus manuscripts. I'm going to start with some explanation about how manuscripts were made, then go on to look at individual works. But of course, it's a huge subject and I'm only barely going to scratch the surface. Manuscripts were normally written on parchment or vellum. Strictly speaking, parchment refers to any animal skin, while vellum refers to calf skin, but the terms too to, too, do tend to be used interchangeably, although vellum does imply a, a finer material. The skin was prepared by washing it with water and lime, then soaking it in lime for several days, then any remaining hair was removed and the skin was dried by attaching it to a frame, dried and stretched as you can see here. And then finally it was polished to give a smooth writing surface. And the postmark down here shows the various tools that were used in that process. The size of the animal governed the size of the book. Each double sheet of one of the great Bibles represents one animal. So a single work can represent literally an entire flock of animals. The first job was to trim the parchment, which of course started out as still vaguely animal shaped. So it was, it was trimmed into the required rectangular size. Then they would prick the holes in the parchment to mark where the lines were to be drawn. Then they started writing using a quill made from the feathers of either a goose or a swan. And that, of course, needed sharpening with a pen, hence the pen knife. Once the work was complete, it would probably be checked by another scribe and any corrections made. And after that, the decoration could begin. And finally, the skins were bound together and a cover added. Most of this presentation is going to look at individual illustrations on the page. But you shouldn't we shouldn't really look at illustrations on their own. They're there to illustrate the text on that page. The style of lettering changed considerably over the medieval period. Anglo-Saxon manuscripts use a script called uncial or half uncial, which you can see here. The letters are picked out individually and very easily easy to see. Later on, the text looked much more like what we would think of as black letter or as Gothic, like this, this Swedish booklet here, for instance. Um, that's from a 15th century book of ours, and it's from Psalm 38. It was standard practice to mark important passages in red ink, and you can see in the Vatican Maxi card here, the whole of that first line has been highlighted in red. And that was also used to record important days in the church calendar, such as saints days. And there the initial letter might be picked out in red. That was called a rubric. And that's why to this day, we still have red letter days. Inks for the text, um, there were two different ways of preparing the ink. You could either make it from carbon, obtained from fine, fine soot or from lamp black, or it was made from iron gall, which was ground oak apples mixed with iron sulfate. And then whichever recipe you used, it was then combined with gum and water to make the ink. The person writing the text was called a scribe. In a religious institution, they might work as an individual or they might work as a group within a scriptorium. And the word scriptorium simply means a place for writing. And we do tend to think of monks as doing this work, but recent um, research has shown that actually it was done by nuns as well. And in a large scriptorium, the various jobs that I've just gone through will be done by different people. So junior monks or nuns would do the preparation, a senior person would write the script, and that would be passed on to one or more other people 
to do the decoration. Copying out a manuscript was a laborious and time consuming task. It's been estimated that scribes working in the period from 900 to 1200, working five to six hours a day, could copy around 200 lines of text a day. So a copy of the Bible might take years. And while the end result of their labors is often beautiful and valuable object, actually producing it was far from easy. The scribes worked in an ill-lit scriptorium, either in a room set aside for the task or a little cell within the cloisters. Artificial light was forbidden for fear of injury to the manuscripts and silence was usually enforced. Manuscript writing was a difficult process that could damage one's health. And this quote was found scribbled in the back of a book by a monk who was clearly having a very bad day. Only try and do it yourself and you will learn how arduous is the writer's task. It dims your eyes, makes your back ache and knits your chest and belly together. It is a terrible ordeal for, for the whole body. But by the later medieval period, as the demand for books grew, particularly in university towns, both writing and illustration became jobs for professional lay people, as well as for monks and nuns. Many of our great houses had scriptoria in their early days. Abbeys and monasteries were places of learning and, and so they needed books. And if they were wealthy enough, they produced the books themselves. For the UK, some religious houses, of course, were lost during the Reformation. Some became cathedrals and they nearly all lost their book collections. And a lot of the very finest actually went to Henry VIII on the dissolution of the monasteries. I can't list all the scriptoria that were, it, were in the UK, but some examples of big scriptoria in abbeys that have now become cathedrals include Canterbury, Westminster, Salisbury, Durham, Peterborough and Winchester. And then of course there are some abbeys which um, disappeared at the dissolution and that includes St Albans and Bury St Edmunds. And there's also, there was also um, a Benedictine nunnery in Winchester called Nunnerminster, which was a major center of production. Center of production. As I said, once the text was finished and checked, it was passed to the painter, to, painter or painters to do the illustration. And there are three basic elements of an illumination. If you read books on the subject, they tend to look at three different aspects of it. The miniature, the initial and the border. The word miniature is described from minium, which is a lead oxide material also known as red lead. One of the pigments used to illustrate and emphasize the capital letters. It didn't imply small and often miniatures could be full page as you can see here from this Luxembourg um, card. There were two different types of initials. There were decorated initials where there was simply um, some, some pattern design, some flight of fancy used to embellish a letter or there were historiated initials. Um, and a historiated initial was one where the letter shape was filled with some with small pictures, which actually told the story of the text that was being written on that page. And illuminated initials have the advantage of highlighting where the start of a new section of a book or a new paragraph or, or chapter starts. The borders are always highly decorative, often quite fanciful. And I'm going to come on to a few examples a little later on. But making and using paints wasn't always a safe occupation. The pigments could be made from animal, vegetable or mineral sources, and some of them would certainly never be allowed today. Red was made from madder root or from lead oxide or from cinnabar, which is mercuric sulfide. Green was made from malachite or from verdigris. Yellow came from saffron or from the mineral orpiment, which is arsenic sulfide. White came from white lead. Blue could be made from azurite. Purple, crimson and blues were also made from lichens and plant, plant extracts such as woad. Wealth and status could be indicated by using silver and even more so by using gold, 
which was either ground to a powder and mixed as a paint or beaten into leaf and laid over. And we call these works illuminated, illuminated because they were lit, lit up by these precious metals. But the rarest was ultramarine, and this was made from lapis lazuli, which at this time had to be imported from Afghanistan. Now, if you think that we're talking 8th, 9th, 10th century, that I, I find that quite remarkable. It was even more costly than gold, and it was commonly used to paint the robes of the Virgin Mary. And then once all these pigments were, were prepared, they were mixed with egg yolk or gum Arabic to apply them to the page. And these pages here come from the Winchester Bible. This was made at St. Swithin's Priory, which was the later became Winchester Cathedral. The text was completed in around 1171 with spaces left for the de decoration, but the decoration was never finished. And it's left a graphic illustration of how the decoration was done. You can see here uh, on this side, the design was drawn using a stick of lead. The lines were then linked in, inked in, then the gold leaf applied, and finally it would have been painted. And in the Bible to this day, there are 93 large decorated initials, but only 40, 42 of them were ever completed, as you can see on this right hand one. And then finally, the last job was to apply was to bind the page, pages and a very rich manuscript required an equally lavish binding. Many had decorated covers. They could use carved ivory, which you can see here. They were covered in gold or silver. You can see on this one. Um, or they could use precious or semi-precious stones, which you can see here and in this cover here. Leather was in use by the 12th century and different kinds of leathers could be used, but most commonly it was calf or goat skin laid over stout wooden boards. And gold tooling, which was sheets of very thin gold impressed on leather, was introduced in the 15th century. At the same time, books for private use could be covered in brightly coloured silk, velvet or brocade. But sadly, because the bindings did use such expensive materials, it's meant many of the manuscripts which have survived have done so without their covers, which at some point in the part, past have been looted for their ivory, for them, for their stones or whatever. So I'm going to go on now to look at some individual manuscripts. I've picked them out either because they've got features of particular interest or see how they've been treated by stamp designers. Starting with an Anglo-Saxon gospel book, St. Chad's Gospels, a gospel book is exactly what it says. It's the first four chapters of the New Testament, the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. This particular work used to be known as the Litchfield Gospels because to this day it's kept in Litchfield Cathedral and that cathedral is dedicated to St Chad and St Mary. It was made around 730, but it's not known where. Suggestions are either Litchfield itself, Northumbria, Wales or Ireland. The, but the Irish connection has inspired two stamps from a long series of their definitives. By tradition, each of the apostles had his own symbol, an angel for St Matthew, a winged lion for St Mark, a winged ox or a bull for St Luke, and an eagle for St John. And the stamp design has taken these images and I think made very attractive standalone stamps from them. On the left here, we've got a page illustrating St. Luke, and I hope you can see there is his symbol of the winged ox. If you look at the face of the stamp and the face there, they're actually pretty well identical. There's his back legs, there's his wings. On the right, we've got St. John. This has been changed rather more. Um, we've got an eagle in flight on this page and an, and an eagle standing still there, but the head I think is still quite similar. Because of the sheer size of the subject I'm trying to, to tackle tonight, I've limited this talk to manuscripts made in the British Isles. Sorry. 
And one of the most famous has got to be the Lindisfarne, Go Lindisfarne Gospels. Oh, sorry. It was made sometime between 698 and 721 on the island of Lindisfarne, which is also now, now known as Holy Island in Northumbria. And we do know who made it. In around 970, a monk named Aldred wrote a note on the final page of the book, which says it was written by Edfrith, Bishop of Lindisfarne. And Edfrith, very unusually, was both scribe and illustrator. And for this, I'm going to look at three pages taken from the Gospel of St. Matthew. Each of the Gospels has one or more initial pages, which are called insipid pages. And this, gar this garner, shot, garner stamp shows the one of the initial pages for Matthew. And you can see the intricacy of the design that went into this. This is the second initial page for, from St. Matthew. The letters on the first line are a very elaborate X and P, a monogram of the first two Greek letters of the word Christos and an ancient symbol for Christ. Aldred, the monk who, who wrote the work, who recorded who wrote the work, also translated the Latin text into Old English. And here you can see his annotations there, there. And he went through the whole work and annotated it. Incidentally, both Gibbons and Scott say this stamp from a miniature sheet of the United Nations, which is celebrating indigenous art, says that this stamp comes from the Book of Kells. Well, it clearly doesn't. And I'm gonna go onto the Book of Kells in a minute and you'll see what I mean. Um, I can only assume that the UN Postal Authority, Postal Administration made a howler when it was sending out the publicity to do with the issue. This page, shows a full page miniature of St. Matthew. He's accompanied by his sing symbol of an angel who's shown here blowing a trumpet. And this figure, peeping his head round the curtain and holding a book, may possibly be the figure of Jesus. It's not in, they're not entirely sure. But designers haven't always treated their source material very well. If we look at this Turks and Caicos miniature sheet, they've taken this page, they've added this somewhat anachronistic border round it. And I really don't think it does the, it does the, initial, the original page any favors. And this is a GB aerogram from 19, AML from 1970. Um, it's supposedly based on the Lindisfarne gospels. I have to say personally, I think it's a bit of a disaster. But that's my, my view. Equally famous, but far, well less, far less documented, is the Book of Kells, which is also a, book of, also a gospel book. It could be Irish or Scottish or English. Dating is vague, somewhere between the early 8th and early 9th century. It was possibly made by monks living on, in Iona, which is in the Inner Hebrides. It's known that in 806 they fled to Ireland when Iona was sacked by Vikings, and they may have taken this book with them. They settled in Kells, which is, about, which is 30 miles northwest of Dublin, and we definitely know, know the book was there by the 12th century. It includes 31 full page illuminations and possibly involved four different artists creating the work. And this prestige booklet, this Irish prestige booklet, shows this page, which is St. John holding a pen and a book. But in this case, he doesn't have his eagle symbol. This image is called Christ enthroned. He's sitting holding a book, which represents the word of God. And I'm not sure this stamp design works terribly well either. They've taken the whole of the page added a second, I think somewhat unnecessary border, which I think rather overpowers it. This image, which is the image of the Virgin and Child, um, was the basis of this Irish Christmas stamp. They've just cropped out and taken the central characters. Um, 
not very flattering faces either of Mary or of Jesus, who has a very pointy nose, I'm afraid. The miniature shoes, again, I don't think does it justice. They've taken the whole page, added an extra border around there, and then an extra border around the outside. And I'm not sure why. It just doesn't need it, to my mind. The next two books I'm going to look at didn't inspire any stamps, but they're of interest in what they tell us about medieval life. Sorry. The first one I'm going to look at is the Luttrell Psalter, which was made between 1325 and 1335, and named after the man who commissioned it, who was Sir Geoffrey Luttrell, a wealthy Lincolnshire landowner. A Psalter, incidentally, contains the Book of Psalms plus some ancillary material. The work's particularly famous for the images in its 400 decorative borders. Um, many of them actually owe, owe more to the person who commissioned the book to, than to the religious subject of the work itself. The borders contain a lot of views of feudal life, which of course are a mine of information for historians. So we've got people here stacking sheaves. There you can see them harrowing the ground and there they are ploughing with an oxen. They all look sort of quite well fed and reasonably happy, and I'm not sure it's an accurate portrait of feudal England, but there we are. So Geoffrey himself pops up in a few places. Um, there's one example here, he's riding his horse with all his official regalia, and there he, there's his wife looking up at him there. And there are real flights of fancy as well in the borders, like these animals here. The, the thing is full of it, with this host of real imaginary creatures. And it's a sort of view into the medieval mind, but not really, because none of us can really understand the thoughts behind these in, in a religious work of art. This work, incidentally, is a manuscript made not by monks, but by laymen probably in a workshop in Lincoln. It is known that Sir Geoffrey Luttrell had a Dominican chaplain in his household, and he may have supervised the professional scribes who produced the work. Going on to the Sherborne Missal, a uh, missal is a book containing all the masses that were set, that were read during the liturgical year. And the Sherborne Missal was made be between around 1399 and 1407, commissioned by Robert Bruning, abbot of the Benedictine Abbey of Sherborne in Dorset. And down here, down the bottom of the page, there you can see the Bishop of Salisbury, and there you can see the abbot of Sherborne. It's thought that this work was the work of one scribe and up to five different artists. And very unusually, both the scribe and one of the painters is named in the text. The scribe was John Wass, who is there, with his name there. And one of the painters was John Zilvervas, who is this gentleman here. And, it, and he wasn't too shy to depict himself in 10 different places in this work. And the full page illustrations do show religious scenes, but many of the small illustrations, including the borders, a bit like the Luttrell Psalter, feature saints, royal benefactors, strange animals, and the feature for which the Sherborne Missal is most famous are 48 images of birds, which are in the borders of each of the pages, as you can see there. Each one's got a label giving its name in Middle English there and there and so on. And we've no idea whether they were symbolic or purely decorative, but um, they they print, they're, they're made a little larger than the faces of people, so they must have been important for some reason. Whoever the artist was, the artist really liked long, graceful tails, because I don't think a robin has got a long tail, and neither is a house sparrow, and neither is a skylark, but they do look quite elegant. But apart from that, actually, they're perfectly recognisable. Look at that woodpecker or that kingfisher. You, you would know it exactly for what it is. So I'm going to come on now and talk about the Christmas story specifically as shown in manuscripts. And I'm going to start with the Delisle Psalter. 
which was made between around 1300 and 1320. Um, at some point it got bound up with another 14th century Psalter and part of the originals lost. But 33 part or full time, full page illuminations survive thought to be by two different artists. And this page shows a sequence of pictures from the story of the birth of Christ. And I've chosen it because it's inspired issues by three, um, three Christmas stamp issues, GB and Cook Islands from 1970 and Dominica 1977 Christmas, e Christmas issue. If we start top left with the nativity scene, Mary's painted in the traditional ultramarine blue. Jesus is kneeling by the uh, kneeling there. And in the background, you can see the ox and the ass. It's a sort of, it's sort of thing that's going on in school and nativity plays everywhere at the moment. And I think you can see the different quality of design in these stamps. I have to say, I do rather like the GB version. The design is not, the design of the original is not crowded out the way it's been laid out here. And I think it looks quite effective. And all three of them have reproduced the shape of the original, which is this very ornate star shape. So if we move to the right, um, it's the angel visiting the shepherds to tell them, tell them that Jesus has been born. Um, and there's a little, um, little thing there. Um, it's the angel singing Gloria in Excelsis Deo. Moving down, the next scene is the circumcision of Jesus. I have to say, I'm not happy with the Dominica design. They've added this very modern Christmassy motif on each stamp as well. It bears no relation to a medieval design. And I think actually, it almost detracts from it. it. It just doesn't relate to it. Then the scene after that is the wise men presenting gifts. The Cook Islands does follow the design very faithfully by keeping a square shape to the stamp, imitating, reflecting the square shape of the original. The British, as you can see, actually, the designer chose to extend it and take this patterned background further up. And the advantage of that, I think what's worked is that it's removed the Queen's head and the de denomination from the design itself. So where in the Cook Islands, it has to overlay the design, here, it leaves the design to speak for itself. Although I did notice that that particular design on the original is red. And while these little patterns are correct, they're in a different color on the GB stamp. Right, then we've got Mary and Joseph taking Jesus to the temple at Jerusalem. And then finally, uh, the flight into Egypt, uh, which is generally regarded as the end of the Christmas story. And that one is only, re is only reproduced on the Dominica set. So you can see here Mary, Mary carrying Jesus, riding on a donkey, uh, Joseph leading the donkey. I don't know who that figure is, but up there, you can, might just see there, and you can certainly see on the stamp, is the figure of a devil, a devil or the devil, I'm not sure. So I'm going to finish the story by looking, by just going through the Christmas story and showing you a range of, of material from uh, various European countries, from a whole range of manuscripts starting with the Annunciation, when the angel Gabriel told Mary that she would miraculously give birth to a son. These are from a range of different dates and the styles vary considerably. Then of course the nativity scene itself, which is by far the most common design found on stamps. And I've only just picked out a few examples. I did look at particular manuscripts earlier, but most grant manuscripts, very little is known about them. And they certainly don't have the documentation that I've just talked about. And a lot of these, um, the stamp catalogs will give you the absolute basics, which is probably not much more than is known. 
like the country of origin, the rough date, and that's it. And this shows the shepherds. That one we do know about. It's French. It's about 1475. And that's as much as I can tell you about it. Or indeed, a lot of my collection says little more than that. And then, then the wise men, that is also French, um, 15th century. It's that vague, I'm afraid. And then finally, the flight into Egypt. As has become obvious as, as I've gone through this, all the scenes and the figures in medieval period were shown as contemporary with the artist. And it does make them a rich source of historical information, really, particularly for period dress. Um, this maxi card, for instance, um, if you have a look at the figure of Joseph, you see very clearly the coat he's wearing, sturdy shoes, nice woolen hat. There's a mass of information out in there for, for historians. I hope what comes out of, of this talk is, is what attracts it to me, which is just the attractiveness of these images. I think they're lovely. How you see it yourself is really, it's in, you know, it's how you see it. You can see them, you can approach, appreciate them as devotional objects. You can enjoy them as works of art, or maybe you can do what their originators intended, which was to do both, both a work of art and a devotional object. And to finish the story, manuscript production didn't stop with the invention of printing. Printing in the West was invented by Johannes Gutenberg in the 1450s. But he and his successors left pages on the printed, left spaces on the printed page to add illustrations by hand afterwards. And this Croatia first day cover here shows the, a page from the Gutenberg Bible, otherwise known as the 42 line Bible. And you can see there, and there you've got illuminated letters and rubrics as well. That I don't think is, I think that's a flight of fancy of the cover designer, but the rest is perfectly genuine. There were two good reasons for doing this really. For a start, uh, when printing started, the only model they had were manuscripts. So that's what they copied. But perhaps more importantly, it was a way to encourage sales. Book collectors wanted beautiful looking objects, and this was how to produce it. A number of copies of the Gutenberg Bible have survived, and the illustration is different in each of them, and that's because they were sold unbound, plain, and the buyer then commissioned the addition of the illustration afterwards. This is the first page from the Gospel of St. John from William Tyndale's New Testament, which was printed in 1526. And you can see how much illustration they've added there. And similarly over here from the 1520s, this is a printed page of a book of hours done by two French brothers, Germain and Gilles Ardois, who specialized in, um, in fine works of printed art. This is page actually is one from my own collection. And every single initial letter has been picked out and the start of a paragraph has been picked out there. So luxury, manuscript, luxury manuscripts actually continue to be made after the printing had started. And they've never really died out. Even to this day, making manuscripts for some people is still a hobby. So that's the end of the talk. I hope you've enjoyed it. And can I just wish all of you a very happy Christmas. And thank you for listening. Thank you. That was really good. Let me yes. just get rid of the recording.